All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. For those of you who um, have attended either the first lecture or the second lecture, um, welcome to those of you who are here for the first time. Uh, this is the third of my four Evans Pritchard lectures this Trinity term. The title of today's lecture is Sharia Politics as Legal Politics. Uh, and in today's lecture, I'm going to discuss the ways that people uh, reclaim religious faith from their governments, bringing Islam in particular into their struggles for human dignity, their struggles for political freedoms, um, their anti-colonial struggle, struggles, um, their struggles against dictators, and their struggles for gender equality and women's rights. Now, before I talk about today's lecture, let me back up and remind you of what we've done and uh, sort of where we're going today. Uh, in last Tuesday's lecture, I focused on how governments take uh, rights from people, uh, the ways that governments use law and religious discourse to take rights as tools of governing. In particular, last week I spoke about this side of the slide, and I'll talk about this week will be this side of the slide that's yet to come. Last week I spoke about uh, this uh, left side of the screen about three different styles of governing, three very, very different styles of governing. Colonialism, uh, dictatorship, or what political scientists would call authoritarian regimes, uh, and humanitarian or democracy-based or human rights-based governance. And I said, you know, these are very different styles of governing. These are very different kinds of people, colonial administrators, dictators, and human rights activists or humanitarian aid workers. Uh, but they share something in common. And what they share is they try to build people's faith in state legal systems, people's faith in law. They try to uh, build people's desire for law and legal systems. And they try and get people to submit to those legal systems. And they all also use law and religion instrumentally as tools of politics. Whether you're a colonial administrator, you're going to create laws. Uh, whether you're a dictator, you're going to create laws. Whether you're a human rights activist, you're going to encourage people to create laws. Uh, and you're also going to use religion in your own way to back up or sort of provide support for the laws that you do create. Uh, and that's what I did last week. That's what I talked about last week. This week, there's another story to be told about the power of religious discourse. It's not just dictators. It's not just colonial administrators and human rights activists who use law and religion or who flatten and sideline Islam, as we talked about last time, the ways that colonial administrators have a specific view of what Islam is, the way that dictators use a very narrow view of Islam to support their dictatorship, uh, and the ways that uh, humanitarian activists also kind of sideline Islam in favor of a human rights approach, a rights-based approach to development. Remember that phrase I talked about last time that governs everything the United Nations Development Program does, $6 billion annual budget, 4,000 projects in 150 countries, all governed by this rights-based approach to development. So there's another story to be told, and that is of activists. Activists, conservative activists, progressive activists, all kinds of activists who are reclaiming religious faith for their own purposes. Uh, in particular, they are using Sharia discourse, uh, religious faith to fight colonial rule, to fight dictatorial rule, and to challenge Western forms of human rights. Western ideas and Western discourse, what they see as Western discourses of human rights. So if last week was about how states take rights from people, then this week is about how people take those rights back. And that's what today is about, and how they use religion and religious discourses to do that. Now, the idea that people use religious faith in their politics and in their activism is, of course, not new. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used his Christian faith to fight uh, against uh, the American government, to fight for uh, uh, civil rights. He led the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who you see on the bottom of your screen, he drew on Hindu scriptures to lead a nonviolent resistance that specifically called for religious pluralism in India. Uh, Dorothy Day, at the top of the screen. Uh, she founded 
the Catholic Worker Movement, uh, which led the call for social and economic justice in cities uh, both in North America and overseas. The Vietnamese Buddhist monk, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, he brought Buddhist principles of compassion, of nonviolence uh, to people across the world. And there are many other, active, uh, many other examples of people using religious faith in their, as a kind of civic duty, a civic calling, people using religious faith in their peace building activities. Now, for these people, this is not new. But for international lawyers, this is a little new because there is a different perspective of religion. There's a different perspective of religion that's circulating in international legal discourse. And that is that religion or religious extremism is a source of violence. And that law is the solution to religious violence. And what I hope to show you today is the way that people use religion as a source of or a solution to legal violence. So I'm gonna flip it on its head today for you. It's not that religion is a source of violence, but rather it's law that's the source of violence and religion is the solution for a lot of people. And that's really what we're, what we're focused on this afternoon. And there are many different types of religious extremism um, that international and domestic legal systems try to resolve, that they see international law or domestic law as resolving the problem of religious extremism. Uh, in the United States, extremists carry Christian Bibles, crosses, flags that said Jesus 2020 as they stormed the U.S. Congress to stop the certification of President Joe Biden's election. Uh, in Sri Lanka, some Buddhist monks have been using uh, religious texts, invoking religion uh, to promote religious nationalism, civil war, the killing of Muslims. Uh, since returning to power last year, uh, the Taliban government in Afghanistan has instituted a kind of gender apartheid, uh, separating women from men. Uh, President Ramzan uh, Kadyrov of the Russian Republic of Chechnya has invoked God, invoked religious faith to curtail uh, LGBT rights. And academics have studied this politics of religious faith. And some of them have concluded, some of them have concluded that because of this kind of religious extremism, religious faith is a threat to the rule of law. Religious threat, faith is a threat to democracy and it's a threat to constitutionalism. Here's a quote from a recent paper in the University of Chicago Law Review uh, by, a group of, by a couple of legal scholars. The rule of law and the rule of God, they say, the rule of law and the rule of God are on a collision course because religion offers a credible threat to the liberal constitutional narrative. So these, characteris these characterizations, I would submit to you, these characterizations show religion as monolithic, as extreme, as detrimental to the rule of law. And I think it's precisely these kinds of characterizations of religious faith that have led international lawyers, that have led uh, international aid agencies uh, to fear religious faith, especially Islam, to try to either correct it, um, or if they can't correct it, to try and avoid it altogether out of maybe offending people's deeply held religious faith. In, in short, religion is believed to increase violence and law is believed to be the solution to decrease violence. And this is no more true than in global understandings of activism around uh, Islam and specifically Sharia. Okay, the Arabic word Sharia uh, means a lot of things to a lot of different people and a lot of different governments. And I think it's important to define it that way, that it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, especially if you're an ethnographer of the law and you're interested in how people create meaning out of these concepts that religious studies scholars say has a very specific meaning. If I were a religious studies scholar, if I were a scholar of Islamic studies, of Islamic texts, um, which I do not claim to be, this is how I would define Sharia. Sharia comes from, it, 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 it has a, a lot of sources in Islam, but the two main sources are the Quran, which is the divine wisdom of God as received by the Prophet Muhammad, and also the Hadith uh, on the top bullet point of the screen. The Hadith, the teachings, uh, the, the actions, 
and the tacit approvals of the Prophet Muhammad during his lifetime. Some scholars add things like qiyas or analogy and other kinds of things as kind of uh, ways of, of, of techniques of using sharia. But I think if you understand these two, these two kind of primary sources, that's great. Literally, sharia is translated as a path or a way uh, typically to water. It signifies cleansing or purity. Uh, but because it can be interpreted in so many different ways by so many different people, uh, including religious study scholars and sort of everyone else uh, who claim they interpret it, uh, it's much broader than, we, than what we would think of here in Western countries as law, as state law, um, or as regulations. Uh, it, it, you can sort of imagine it as ethics uh, or codes of norms that guide people's behavior, their relationship with God, um, their worship, um, their daily activities, their protection of themselves, their bodies, other people around them, their families, the environment. Um, so that's, that's, that's Sharia. It's, it's not really, as I said, a strict legal code. It's more of an ethical code guiding behavior. I'd be happy to talk about that more in the Q&A if people have, in the discussion we have afterwards, if people have questions. But for right now, what I want you to see is that Sharia, this, is being denigrated. And nearly all 50 U.S. states have introduced bills banning Sharia. The map you see on the left side of the screen shows the 200 different anti-Sharia laws that have been introduced across the United States. Uh, American senators have publicly labeled Sharia uh, evil and incompatible with American law. The European Court of Human Rights has twice ruled that Sharia is incompatible with human rights. Uh, even regimes in uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and other Muslim-majority countries, they themselves have derided Sharia in their own ways, calling anti-regime activists as stealth jihadis who are seeking Islamic law. My research demonstrates instead how people use Sharia differently to fight colonial rule, to fight dictatorship, to fight patriarchy. And to make this argument, I draw from my historical research and ethnographic fieldwork in Somalia and, and Somali land. And in my fieldwork, I discovered the remarkable ways, remarkable ways that Somalis, the better part of 140, 150 years, that they have embraced Sharia. They are taking rights back. They are reclaiming Sharia as a form of legal politics. So here's the overview, what I'm hoping to do uh, in, this, in this talk today, in this lecture. Specifically, I wanna talk about how Somali activists have been invoking Sharia to fight for political freedoms, to fight for political freedoms. First, and, and it will be, some of this will be historical. Some of this will be historical and some of it will be contemporary because I want you to see that this is not just a new project. This is something that is long standing. So first I'll talk about anti-colonial activists in the first part of the 20th century. So a little more than hundred years ago, the ways that anti-colonial activists were using Sharia, using or invoking what they called and what they thought of as Sharia to fight British colonialism. Then I want to talk about post-colonialism and the ways that religious leaders and others have been using Sharia to fight against dictatorial rule. And in Somalia in particular, when the dictatorship fell, they also used Sharia uh, to fight warlords who had sort of taken over different neighborhoods of leading cities in Somalia. Uh, and, and a group of courts united, the Sharia courts, or what became the Islamic Courts Union, united and expelled the warlords specifically because these courts used Sharia or invoked Sharia. And third and finally, I'll talk about contemporary women's rights activists and the ways that they have invoked Somali sophisticated uh, women's rights activists who have been invoking religious faith, invoking Sharia uh, for gender equality, women's rights uh, in their struggle against patriarchy. Okay, so that's the three things, sort of Sharia to fight colonialism, topple dictatorships and warlords, and then also to fight for women's rights. And that'll take us uh, through today's talk. Let me start with this first example of Sharia politics, and that is the ways that uh, Somali anti-colonial activists, and I want to add the British here because they responded with their own kind of Sharia, and I think that's really important to share. 
Somali anti-colonial activists and British colonial administrators themselves both used Sharia against one another about 100 years, a little more than 100 years ago. And my focus here is on the British Somaliland Protectorate, the British Somaliland Protectorate. Uh, this was, as I said, largely during the first um, uh, 20 years of the 20th century. So if I go back a couple of slides, uh, I'm talking about that northern region, what's known as Somaliland today, what the rest of the world kind of sees as northern Somalia. But actually last week they declared uh, uh, 31 years of self-rule from the rest of Somalia. So I'm talking about that region. So just to kind of place it in your head, it's that region of the kind of northeastern tip of the Horn of Africa um, in Eastern Africa. So remember last week when I discussed British colonialism in Sudan, and even for those of you who are not here, the, the British in Somaliland did something very similar. So even if you weren't here last week, um, this will make sense uh, to you. The, the British in Somaliland uh, devolved power to local elites. This was a colonial strategy they did in many, many different places. And as in Sudan, in British Somali, what was called, what they called British Somaliland, the British set up two different court systems, one judiciary, but two court systems, a civil court system that largely dealt with penal or criminal matters um, and a Sharia court system or division of the judiciary that largely dealt with uh, family matters, inheritance, some business transactions, uh, divorce, uh, marital issues. Um, and many Somalis access the courts that the British set up, much like in Sudan. If you remember last week, I had these graphs showing how many people were accessing the courts in, in colonial Sudan. But not everyone was doing it. Not all Somalis believed in this project of you know, the British are setting up these courts and it's a space for us to resolve our disputes. Not all Somalis were on board with that whole idea of British colonization through law. And there was one Somali in particular. His name was Sheikh. Muhammad Abdullah Hassan, or Sayyid Hassan in Somali. Uh, he was probably the most prominent Somali anti-colonial activist. Um, so if you haven't heard about him, you've heard about him now because most every Somali has heard about this person. Um, and to try to discredit him because he was a religious leader, a scholar, um, and he fought against British colonial uh, uh, rule, both violently with weapons, but also using Sharia. Um, the British newspapers and the British colonial administration actually uh, called him the Mad Mullah. Some of you may have heard this phrase, the Mad Mullah. This was, this was the person. Okay, so who is Sheikh Hassan? Who is Sheikh Hassan? So in the 1880s, he left Somaliland um, to travel to Mecca to study Islam uh, with a tariqa. And he returned to Somaliland, and he became a kind of traveling orator, a poet, a kind of nationalist. He gained a reputation... Um, for his poetry. At the time, Somali, it wasn't until the 1970s when the Somali script actually came into existence. Somali was only an orally communicated language at this time. It was only orally communicated. And, and that was how you kind of made yourself a political leader, was through your oratory skills. Um, the, the historian Saeed Samatar called Sheikh Hassan, uh, quote, a literary master. Uh, and Samatar uses this phrase that, that uh, Sheikh Hassan was, quote, the George Washington of Somali nationalism and the Shakespeare of Somali language. So he was a literary figure. He was a political figure. He was dynamic. Um, and the British at first, they liked the guy. They thought he was interesting and useful because he also was setting up courts to resolve people's disputes, much like the British were doing. And the British thought, you know, he's bringing peace to communities, not a bad thing. Eventually, he started seeing himself more like a religious leader, and he started seeing uh, British colonialism as sort of against Islam, and he started preaching against British colonization. And he and his followers, on the one hand, and the British and sort of their communities or tribes or clans, as, as they've come to be known, uh, they each began to amass horses, weapons, uh, militiamen, and then they started a war against one another. And a lot of historians have written about this war, um, that lasted roughly from the late 1890s until about 1920. Um, I'm less interested in, I mean, it's interesting, the, the details of the war are, are extremely interested, interesting. 
uh, if you're especially if you're interested in military history, both Somali and British military history. What I'm interested in is alongside their war of weapons, there was a war of words between Sheikh Hassan and the British colonial administration telling each other that they each didn't understand Sharia better than the other. And I want to I want to go through some of the archival records I found um, that display for you how they kind of argued to one another uh, where they were invoking Sharia. The British colonial administration invoking Sharia against Sheikh Hassan and Sheikh Hassan invoking Sharia against the British. So in one letter, in one letter, Sheikh Hassan tells the British, you are colonizing us and that is against Sharia. Uh, Sheikh Hassan writes, it is the duty of both of us. It is the duty of me as a Muslim, he says, and the duty of you as someone in a Muslim area to follow Sharia. The passage continues, God says you order people to be righteous and forget your own selves. And if you are reading God's book, are you not able to understand this? Do you see Sheikh Hassan telling the British, you think you understand Islam and Sharia, but you don't. You are not being righteous by colonizing us. And the British responded to these accusations. They responded to these accusations with Sharia, telling the Sheikh, no, your actions, your violence against us is contrary to Sharia. Then Sheikh Hassan responds and tells the British, if you know so much about Sharia, why don't you bring some learned men to discuss Sharia with me? Bring some Muslims. So the British say, sure, we'll bring some Muslims. So they get some guys, some envoys from Sudan. Uh, Britain is also colonizing Sudan at this time. They bring some religious leaders from Sudan to meet with Sheikh Hassan. And they say, and Sheikh Hassan says, um, when, when he, sir, before, before the British bring these religious leaders from Sudan, Sheikh Hassan says, if you bring these religious leaders to me, Muslims, to me, uh, and if we find out we're wrong, we will repent. We will repent, he says, and this is the quote that's on the screen. If we are wrong about our interpretation of Sharia, we will repent before God and the prophet, and we will never again fight the Christians or their subjects. So the British, British say, okay, that's an invitation for some kind of dialogue. So then they bring um, the Muslim scholars from Sudan, and the records show that the British officials actually did bring these Muslim scholars from Sudan. Um, they called upon these envoys to meet with Sheikh Hassan in Somaliland, and they did this in 1909. And the Sudanese religious leaders told Sheikh Hassan, quote, to fully explain publicly. They told him, please, stay publicly, let go of your weapons and say publicly that your deeds are contrary to Sharia Muhammadiyah. They called Sharia Muhammadiyah. So effectively, the Sudanese envoys told Sheikh Hassan exactly what the British administration wanted the Sudanese envoys to tell Sheikh Hassan, you're wrong, you don't understand Sharia. These other Muslims in Sudan, and, and there, were, there was another story of Muslims from Mecca doing the same thing, uh, telling him, stop your rebellion, it's against Islam. So the British weren't saying, stop your rebellion, it's against peace. Stop your rebellion, it's against human rights. They were invoking Islam themselves, even though they were non-Muslims. Eventually, the communication soured and uh, Sheikh Hassan tells the British, you have no, and the Sudanese envoys for that matter, you have no knowledge or sense or spark of religion, and in fact, you know nothing about Sharia. The British then say in their latest communications, um, they say that Sheikh Hassan was, quote, neither a good Mohammedan or a good Christian. The Sheikh ultimately dies in 1920, uh, presumably of influenza or malaria. Um, but Somaliland never recovered from this 20, 22 year war. Um, it was one of the longest and greatest tests that Islam ever placed on a British colonial administration. So what I've tried to provide you here is some, some details, some historical detail about the ways that anti-colonial activists bring Sharia into battle, create a war of discourse, of words, but the British are also doing the same. Colonial administrators are responding with more Sharia, and they do it rhetorically, they do it strategically, and they do it ideologically. I think both Sheikh Hassan and the colonial administrators um, are the same in that respect. Some of you might be thinking, well, what is Sharia here? What, they're all calling it Sharia, but what is Sharia Muhammadiyah? And I think the way I would answer this is that it is whatever each of them wanted it to be. The fact is they were invoking this thing against one another. It has a specific meaning in religious discourse, 
and it's a very powerful meaning. But they're each invoking it for their own kinds of politics, for their own kind of um, legal strategies. For the British, uh, Sharia is something that supported colonization. For Sheikh Hassan, Sharia was something that didn't support colonization. Sharia was whatever they wanted it to be in their politics. And after independence, after independence, I'm getting now to the second example I wanted to talk about. After independence, both in Somaliland, in the north, and in Somalia, um, other nationalists would also invoke Sharia um, to fight dictatorships and to fight warlords. And here I focus. Here I'll focus specifically on the activism of religious of religious leaders. This activism, I want to share with you an important period in post-colonial Somali history. So I want to go back now, about 50 years ago, uh, to the 1970s. This is a really, really important period that sort of set the stage for the Somalia that, that people know and talk about today. This is a really critical period, this period in the 1970s. There was a dictator in power. Here he is meeting with Ronald Reagan. Uh, his name was Muhammad Siad Bari. And he embraced Sharia rhetorically to garner support for socialism. Uh, the quote you see on the screen is one of many examples, one of many examples of Siad Bari saying publicly that Sharia and socialism, he kind of fashioned himself as a kind of socialist dictator early in his rule, that Sharia and socialism were compatible. And so in 1975, in 1975, Siad Bari introduces a family law. It has many articles, like 130, 140 different articles in the family law. And one article in particular was an inheritance provision, an inheritance provision. And it said women and men, sons and daughters, must inherit equally from their parents. And a group of religious leaders spoke out uh, in the local mosque in Mogadishu. They said the law was, quote, un-Islamic. They said the law was against Sharia. Uh, and their reasons were that daughters in Islam generally, in, in most forms of Islamic law, daughters generally inherit only partially from their parents because they also inherit from their husbands. And so it all roughly kind of works out because daughters inherit twice and the sons um, won't inherit, the sons don't have husbands, so they can't inherit from their husbands. And so uh, the point is the sheikhs disagreed publicly with the dictator. That's the point. They disagreed publicly with the dictator. They spoke out in, uh, in the mosques. In, in, the, in the central mosque in Mogadishu. And Siad Bari uh, saw their speeches, not just as uh, against uh, his law, but also as against him, as against the legitimacy of his rule. And so he had these religious scholars arrested. And within a week, they were all sent. There were about, some records say 10, some say 12. Um, they were executed uh, by, firing, by firing squad ostensibly for opposing gender equality. Uh, and this episode is seared into the memories of many Somalis I met. And my point in mentioning this episode, this killing of these religious leaders, these religious men, is that Siad Bari and the sheikhs who despised him, they fought one another by turning to Islam. He turned to his own form of Islam, that it supported gender equality. They turned to their own form of Islam, that it didn't support gender equality in that kind of way. And each of them tried to wrest control of the meaning of Sharia and politics. So what is Sharia again? It's whatever each of them wants it to be. It's what the religious scholars say it is in 1975, in January of 1975. And it's what Siad Bari says it is. And if you disagree with him, he will make sure you die because of it, which is precisely what he did to those religious men. Now, the executions of these religious men, I don't want to suggest that, that that this means that uh, women's rights is incompatible with Islam. I'll talk later on precisely about how women activists use Islam uh, to fight for women's rights, to demand their rights. But the executions do suggest that at least for the sheikhs, Sharia was incompatible with authoritarian rule. And Sharia had, or rather Islamic dissent, had for them dem democratic characteristics since it involves opening the law to multiple interpretations of religious faith, not just the kind of interpretation that's put forward by the regime. Okay, this execution of these religious men 
I, I told you this was a very important episode in Somali history. It's seared into the memories of Somalis because it was the first of many cracks that ultimately led to the downfall of Siad Bari and the collapse of Somalia as a nation as we know it when Siad Bari fled in 1991. And there was this vacuum of state power. There wasn't a vacuum of power. There was a vacuum of state power. Throughout the 1990s and into, into the 2000s, warlords took control of Mogadishu, the capital city. And then in the mid-2000s, something remarkable happened. Something remarkable happened in the mid-2000s. A group of Sharia courts, um, they emerged uh, to resolve disputes in local neighborhoods. They actually emerged before the mid-2000s. But what happened in the mid-2000s is they united. They united and formed the Islamic Courts Union. They took the name Islamic Courts Union, or Itahad al-Mahakim al-Islamiyya. And the courts resolved people's disputes, um, inheritance, divorce, uh, business transactions. There were a lot of local business uh, businessmen who, who they worked with, contracts. Um, and one civic activist I met who lived under the Islamic Courts Union, she told me that the Islamic Courts, quote, created a new sense of opportunity in Somalia for the Somali people. And the courts didn't just provide legal services. They also provided social services, hospitals, uh, education. The courts also arrested and expelled Mogadishu's most notorious warlords from southern Mogadishu into northern Mogadishu. And then take, the courts kind of took control of, uh, of Mogadishu itself. Um, and within a short period of time, Somalis told me how they began to unlock their doors come out into the streets. There were garbage services. There were hospitals and schools that were reopening. And it was the first time in 15 years, since Siad Bari had fled Somalia in 1991, it was the first time in 15 years that Somalis had submitted themselves to an institutionalized legal authority. And it was precisely the court's Muslim, or sorry, their Islamic identity that helped people to trust in them. Now, the ICU, the, the Islamic Courts Union, it's a very complicated organization. If you see it like it's an early government, you can see that, it, like many early governments, it's really complicated. There's a lot of infighting. There are some progressives. There are some moderates. There are some who adopted a more austere version of Islam, uh, maybe a more radical version of Islam. There are some who adopted a more progressive, or some people like to use the word tolerant version of Islam. But the ICU, the Islamic Courts Union, was blanket labeled as a terrorist organization by the United States. And this was during the War on Terror, 2006, 2007, the height of the War on Terror. And the United States gave Ethiopia its blessing. Ethiopia was very concerned about the growth of a kind of Islamic state uh, nearby. The United States gave and funded and gave its support to Ethiopia to invade Mogadishu to destroy the Islamic Courts Union. Uh, the most progressive of the Islamic courts judges fled overseas, or they kind of just merged back into society. Uh, the, the, the other judges who remained, they regrouped. Many of them founded um, what came to be known as an organization that actually still exists today, Al-Shabaab, which has been terrorizing various parts of East Africa, Somalia, um, in, including parts of Somaliland, um, and uh, Kenya, different parts of uh, the coastal regions of Kenya. Um, Al-Shabaab has its own politics of Sharia, which I'd be happy to um, share with you. Um, but I wanted to give you this brief history of the kind of precursor organization, the Islamic Courts Union. I wanted to share that with you because it provides evidence. The reason I talked about this, the reason I talked about this is because the Islamic Courts Union provides evidence of kind of a grassroots solidarity under Islam. It's not a perfect solidarity, especially if you believe in progressive pr principles. It's not a perfect Islam, excuse me, a perfect solidarity. But it does provide evidence of this kind of solidarity under Islam. They brought an end to warlord rule. They had popular legitimacy. They were successful. And the words of another activist I met, this quote is not on the screen, um, who said, uh, they listened to the people and because they were part of the people. The Islamic Courts Union listened to the people because they were part of the people. So they had that kind of trust. And it's not just in Somalia, but Sharia was also the basis of legal and constitutional order in Somaliland. Remember, I told you last week, Somaliland celebrated 31 years of autonomy and self-rule from Somalia. And they provide probably the strongest evidence of democratic progress in the Horn of Africa region. 
uh, maybe even broader than that. Um, but they're not recognized as a nation um, really by any other nation in the world. And these are examples of um, records uh, from summits, um, Gurti summits they're called, summits of elders. Um, there were five of them held during the 1990s. And you could sort of imagine them as constitutional conventions. Uh, like there was a constitutional convention setting up the United States when the U.S. broke apart from the, the colonies in the United States broke apart from the U.K., from the king's rule in the U.K. And you can kind of see these uh, summits that happened from 1991 until 2001 as a sort of series of constitutional conventions in Somaliland that set up this nation of Somaliland. And today they have their own currency, they have their own education system, they have their own government, they have their own military. For all intents and purposes, they're, they're separate from Somalia. And the basis of all of that is Islam. All of these summits, all of these summits, and here's just a couple of photos I wanted to fit on a slide. All of these summits said very clearly, Sharia is the basis of our society, Sharia is the basis of our legal systems. And in 2001, Somaliland embraces its own national constitution that also says Sharia is the basis of all laws, Sharia is the basis of our society. Okay, so let me summarize where we are so far. Let me summarize these two shaded points before I get to this third point. Let me summarize where we are so far. I've described the historical ways that Somalis have used Sharia in colonial and post-colonial Somalia to fight colonialism, to fight dictators like Siad Bari, uh, to topple warlords in Mogadishu and establish the Islamic courts. And in all of these cases, Sharia was the basis of social, legal, and constitutional ordering. But all of these people I discussed so far, all of them were men. All of them were men. For centuries, men have dominated Somali families, Somali states, and the law. They have been the leaders of colonial governments. They have been the fighters against colonial governments. They have been the leaders of state governments. They have been the dictators, and they have been the fighters against dictatorships. And they have been the leaders of elders' councils, because women were often left out from those elders' councils. And the leaders of religious orders, because women were left out from those religious orders. And so I want to turn now to Somali women. I want to turn now to Somali women, especially, and this is where it gets contemporary in terms of my field work, especially the sophisticated women activists whom I met during my research. Um, they have taken up and used the same religious tools uh, that the men I talked about earlier have been using. Uh, and they've been doing it to sow, to create, to reclaim a different understanding of Sharia, to take their rights back from all of these different men who have their own interpretation of what Sharia means. Um, like the other people I discussed in this talk, they also have turned Sharia politics into a form of legal politics. They've also turned Sharia into a form of politics. And the reason this is important, the reason this is important, turning Sharia into a form of politics is, especially for women activists, is international lawyers often expect that women would do the opposite. Uh, that women would be sort of fighting against Sharia. And indeed, there are important Somali women activists overseas who have been arguing against Sharia, that Sharia is part of the problem. Um, and in, in Western policy circles, there's sort of this view um, that animates, sometimes literally, sometimes not so literally, uh, this view that Muslim women um, need to be, quote unquote, saved from Muslim men who interpret Sharia narrowly. Um, and, the re and the way to save Muslim women is through human rights. The way to save Muslim women is through an attitude or a di discourse of what I talked about last week, a rights-based approach to development. Uh, indeed, saving w women was part of the rationale, the very overt rationale um, of the United States for invading Afghanistan in 2001 in a radio address one month after the invasion. Uh, then First Lady Laura Bush said that American military gains meant that Afghan women were, quote, no longer imprisoned in their own homes. So justifying the war on terror, saying it's a success. This was a month after the initial invasion in fall of 2001. Success. Why? Because women are no longer imprisoned in their own homes. But what I want you to see is that rather than being, rather than being oppressed by Sharia, 
the women activists I met saw Sharia as a source of their rights. The women I met were sophisticated, they were educated, they were multilingual. Some of them were also trained as lawyers. Um, these were working professionals. These were working professionals, like many of you in this room. Uh, and they lived in uh, the Horn of Africa. Let me tell you the story of one activist I met in Somaliland. Um, we'll call her Asha. Asha. And Asha had memorized the Quran at a, at a young age. Um, she taught herself Islamic theology. She memorized volumes of hadith. Uh, teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Asha would have been considered a religious leader, uh, a sheikha, a sheikha, a, a female religious leader, had she been in another country, like in Sudan, um, where there are women religious leaders and there are women religious court, uh, Islamic court judges. But in Somaliland, I think for cultural reasons, she was not a religious leader because of her gender. That's that's really the reason, because of her gender. And I met Asha because she had spoken publicly in Somaliland about women in politics. And she said that many people cited the Prophet Muhammad, that quote, uh, a nation will not prosper if they give their affairs to a woman. A nation will not prosper if they give their affairs to a woman. But Asha knew about Islam and she studied Islam, like a religious leader would study Islam, a religious, uh, a, a, a learned person. And she said the prophet was not talking about all women. He wasn't talking about all women or all nations, that any time a woman is in power, nations won't prosper. She said the prophet was talking about one particular person, a queen in Persia, who had ordered the execution of Muslims. And on top of that, Asha said, the prophet entrusted the distribution of the Quran to his surviving wife, a woman. And Asha spoke out and wanted people to ask themselves. She wanted people to ask themselves, if the Prophet Muhammad did not want women to be in power, why would he effectively entrust the entire religion of Islam in his dying days? Why would he effectively entrust the entire religion of Islam to a woman? And many women's rights activists like Asha have been asking themselves this question. And like Asha, they have been interpreting Sharia and they have been embracing Sharia for women's rights. And the primary question is why? Why are they doing it? Why are they turning to Sharia rather than away from Sharia for women's rights? Why are people like Asha using Sharia? Why choose Sharia in the struggle against patriarchy? I think there are a lot of reasons, and I want to highlight maybe three of them for you. And that's the left side of the screen. Three reasons why women are adopting uh, this Sharia first strategy. Maybe not a human rights first strategy, but a Sharia first strategy. First, there are scriptural resources in Islam that they can turn to um, that affirm women's rights. Second, uh, the women activists I met, so that's the second bullet point now, um, they turned to Islam for practical reasons because they felt they needed the support of male religious leaders. They needed the support of religious leaders. And third, um, the bottom point on the left side of your screen, um, the women activists I met understood that Somalis viewed the Western aid groups, uh, the United Nations, um, who were active in the region, with uh, suspicion. They also viewed state discourses of law with suspicion. Remember Siad Bari and this history of dictatorship. And so Somalis viewed state law, they viewed human rights law, all of this with, with suspicion. So that kind of practically turns women away from state law, away from human rights, and towards discourses that use religion. So in terms, let me talk about each of these in, in sort of more detail. In terms of this first reason, women activists uh, invoked scriptural resources to fight for a number of issues. Uh, one of them was girls' education. And to do it, they, the activists reminded people of Quranic verses and prophetic teachings that if you educate a girl, then you educate a nation. And you see this on the right side of your screen, uh, this photograph on the right side of your screen, a large billboard showing an image of a young girl with a school book and a pen. Uh, and, and then this phrase, if you educate a girl, you educate a nation. And this was a large billboard um, in the town center, in the city center in Hargesa in Somalia. Um, women also, the activists also reminded people that Islam has no prohibition on allowing girls to play sports. Um, when many parents were preventing their daughters from playing sports. Um, 
that Islam has no prohibition on uh, women joining politics to encourage women to stand for office, to run for elected office in Somalia. Now, my point in giving you these examples, and there are many others of women in education, uh, girls in education, uh, women in sport, uh, women in government, is to show you how women are promoting, women activists I met, are promoting rights by turning to Islamic scriptural resources. The second thing they're doing is that the women are doing is a little more practical because the women themselves can't really speak out and say, some of them are doing it, like Asha, who I mentioned, and they're saying more publicly, um, look, Islam demands women's integrity, women's health, women's bodily integrity, and other kinds of things. But in, in a place like uh, Somalia, Somaliland, where religious leaders are very trusted in society and religious leaders are entirely men, the women felt like they needed the support of religious leaders to say publicly what the women knew in their hearts Islam provided for them. Um, so one thing women did, the activists I met did, was um, getting sheikhs together in workshops. Remember the last couple of lectures I gave? These workshops are really, really important. Um, international NGOs, uh, United Nations officials, uh, aid workers, they lead these workshops for one another. I talked about workshops on restorative justice in Somaliland. I talked about legal awareness workshops in the internally displaced persons camps in Sudan, if you remember in my first lecture, as well as in the last lecture. And these women ran their own workshops for religious leaders. And when I asked women, why do you do this? Why do you bring these men together, these religious leaders, into these workshops? And, and one activist told me that the religious leaders, quote, can speak authoritatively on Sharia. And they're the ones who can work out the tension between Sharia, custom, and Somali state law. They're the ones who can work out this tension. Another woman said simply, Somalis, quote, are patriarchal. If women need something, then men, especially a sheikh, have to defend them. And so this is what the women were doing, the activists were doing, trying to get sheikhs to come to these workshops, to talk about privately in these workshops about Sharia, what the women knew Sharia said, so that they ultimately could say it publicly on Fridays in their sermon. But the sheikhs in these workshops often agreed with these women privately, and they said, yes, 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 we see what you're saying. Forced marriage, child marriage, early marriage, these have impacts, especially if there's a young girl and she gives birth before, um, before the age of puberty. These things are against Islam, which promotes bodily integrity. But the sheikhs refused to speak out publicly about these issues. So in private, with these women activists, they would say, yes, we see what you're saying, we understand. But publicly, the sheikhs didn't speak up. After one workshop on preventing child marriage, some sheikhs accused the women activists of, quote, promoting an alien agenda from the West, even though the women were clearly focused on Islam, not on Western human rights. The third reason, bottom of the screen on the left, the third reason that women are turning to Sharia is perhaps um, really practical, and that is, um, knowing the local historical and geopolitical context of the region. Um, so remember I said Siad Bari's family law um, resulted in the public execution of chips. The religious leaders disagreed with Siad Bari and, he was executed, and they were executed. Um, this episode in Somali history um, is, as I said before, it's really seared into people's memories, this killing of these, of these religious leaders. Uh, and many Somalis today see women who promote gender equality as if they're advocating for a murderous contempt of Islam. Um, and this leads women to promote human rights in Islam as opposed to outside of Islam. Uh, I want to quote one woman, woman activist. This quote is not on your screen, but I want to mention it to you. She said, the assassinations of these men, these religious men back in the 1970s, um, so 50 years ago, and she told me, these assassinations affect us even today when we are campaigning for women's rights. Many Somalis, she said, feel suspicious that we are working for what that regime did, that we are trying to kill religious men. So when women turn to Islam, they shift the conversation of women's rights and make it about protecting Islam, which then al allows them to be seen as avoiding um, uh, uh, promoting dictatorship. It allows them to be seen as avoiding promoting dictatorship or the killing of religious leaders. 
Uh, so those are the historical pressures women face, the history of, of Somalia itself, which Somaliland was a part of. But there's also the pressures of Western aid groups that these women face. Uh, many Somalis view these Western aid programs with distrust. They're coming with sort of a non-Islamic framework uh, and, and rendering a Western-based, Somalis see as Western-based advocacy for human rights. And many people view these programs with mistrust like they're designed, much like Siad Bari tried to do, like they're designed to limit the power of Islam or curtail or sideline or even destroy Islam, like many people thought Siad Bari was trying to do. And if you remember in last week's lecture, I, I mentioned a restorative justice workshop led by a Muslim European lawyer who went to Somaliland uh, for religious leaders. Uh, and, and the word Sharia and Islam was not mentioned at all during the workshop. And I explained last week about that process of sort of international aid groups kind of sidelining or flattening Islam. Okay, let me summarize this point by saying that Somali women activists are reclaiming rights by giving primacy to Sharia. They are bringing together piety with practicality, performing law and performing faith by submitting to both of them together. Okay, let me summarize in my last uh, about three or four minutes. In today's lecture, I've given you a broad sweep of 140 years of religious-based activism in Somalia and Somaliland. And I've given you a variety of examples of Somalis using, invoking Sharia to fight for political freedoms, for national identity, for justice, for gender equality. Anti-colonial activists like Sheikh Mohammed Abdullah Hassan and the British both used Sharia against one another, and the British labeled him a mad mullah. The British probably could have labeled themselves the mad mullahs, the way they use Sharia as well. Somalis also invoked Sharia as a discourse to limit the power of Siad Bara's dictatorship, and later to build a path to peace through the Islamic courts in Mogadishu. That was the Islamic courts union. But each time Somalis tried to do this, each time they tried to use Sharia, they were either killed, they either had to fight wars, they were either destroyed by dictatorships or foreign invaders in the name of a war on terror. And today's women activists are actively producing feminist, legal, and religious knowledge. And they do it by disentangling women's rights from the West, disentangling women's rights from Somalia's history with dictatorship, and disentangling women's rights from religious men themselves, from religious leaders themselves, who see Sharia narrowly as unsupportive of women's concerns. Okay, now let me really step back and zoom out. The last three lectures. In the last three lectures, since the start of the month, I have drawn from my years of fieldwork in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Somalia, Somaliland, to show you the connections between the legal and the theological, how governments take rights from people, and how people then reclaim those rights the governments take using uh, a combination of law and religious activism. And I give you this summary because next week I'm going to do something a little different in my lectures. Next week I will zoom out even further to talk about how I was able even to do this kind of research and what I learned about positionality in the process of doing this research over the last years, 15 years. Positionality is about acknowledging and sharing how our identities our backgrounds, our identifications, our gender, our class, our ethnicity, our race, other kinds of uh, 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 self-identifications, how these shape the research that we do, how these shape the very questions that we are able to ask and how they shape our findings, but then how they also in turn shape ourselves as researchers and as scholars. And I hope as I investigate positionality with you next week, you think about your own positionality in the research that you do. Positionality, um, uh, just to give you a little teaser for next week, it's not anything that's new. The ancient Greeks talked about it roughly 3,600 years ago. It is increasing in, uh, in, in uh, discussion uh, because of a kind of increase in uh, understanding of marginality as a kind of positionality uh, over the last maybe three or five years in research. But for now, summarize today's lecture by saying that Somali activism shows us how people invoke religious faith, Sharia, to build peace, 
to build what they see as a path to the rule of law, something that many international lawyers, many uh, Western legal scholars have hoped that the rule of law would be doing because they see law as a solution to religious violence. But what I hope I've shown you today, again, is that people are doing the opposite, invoking religion as a solution to legal violence. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to your comments and questions and our discussion on the ways people have used Sharia as a form of legal politics.